Hey, Annie, I think we're out of cream. Annie, are you okay? You look different. Shh, Jess, it's me. Ick. Boy, Ann, why are you wearing an Annie mask? Shh, I'm undercover. I'm trying to find out what Unicorn is getting me for my birthday. Your birthday isn't for a few months. Exactly. He'll never suspect a thing. <laughs> This season of the Bug Hunters Cafe is made possible by Soft Terrific, Mouse Paw Media, and Manning Publications. Who said that? It's me. I'm under the table. Why are you down there? I'm gathering intel. As in information? No, as in I dropped a box of processors. My car has been blown. Boyan, you should have known that the unicorn would never think you're Annie. Your stature is different, your voice is wrong. It was worth a try. Hmm. Before you go there, the unicorn won't believe you're me either. You're probably right. <gasps> but I can disguise myself as our guest. Oh, please don't. Who is our guest, anyway? Max Guernsey the Third. He's a second generation software developer a managing member at Devcraft LLC and the author of Unit Testing with Java, JUnit 5 and IntelliJ IDEA. Live project from Manic. He also looks like this. You have a mask already. Yep. You know he's standing right behind you, right? Hi, Max. Hi, how you doing? <laughs> Good. Have a have a seat. Don't mind the um, mask. That definitely does not look like anybody we know. <laughs> <laughs> it was sort of a try. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's that. So, um, yeah, uh, Max. Can I get you anything to drink? We have uh, coffee, tea, um, juice. Any other, any other known cafe drink on the planet, including some that don't exist. Coffee with heavy cream. Okay. Mm. I will, I will get that. Do you want to mix up your usual this time, Boyan? No, just the usual, but with extra rainbows this time. Okay. Cappuccino without any coffee and extra rainbows. Yep. I'll be right back with that then. Max, I heard some great rumors about you. Apparently you have aura that prevents bugs from ever coming to existence. Tell me your secret. Well, I don't know if I have an aura that prevents them from ever coming into existence, but... I definitely have a strategy that tries to discourage them from coming into existence. Strategy, magic, what's the difference? <laughs> <laughs> I guess it depends on, on whether or not you understand how it works. Um, <laughs> probably looks like magic if you don't. So <laughs> my strategy is, I guess in order to talk about my strategy, we'd have to, have to kind of take a step back and, and think about why bugs happen in the first place. So why don't you tell me uh, what your definition of a bug is? I think you have a pretty strong one here. Oh, Jason is my go-to man. He knows all the definitions. Yeah, I, I, I guess I'm the definition guy. Here's your, here's your coffee, um, Max, you. and yours, Boyan. Thank you. Um, yeah, so our, I, I caught the last part of that. So yeah, our, our definition of bugs is pretty much just anything that is unexpected to the user. That makes sense. That makes sense. That's a good definition. So with that definition, that sort of thing doesn't just occur, right? It's not like, you know, we're walking down the street and our software was, was great. And then suddenly, through no action of our own, it's doing something that a user doesn't expect, right? We put it there. Right. Yeah. Right. So my bug hunting strategy my first bug hunting strategy is to try to stop that, try to stop us from putting it there. And there's a couple reasons why people might put it there. I think the biggest one is um, a lack of understanding of the requirements. And that lack of understanding can happen kind of anywhere up the requirements definition chain. Um, it could happen at the team, not understanding what their, well, I just to use Scrum terminology, what their product owner is telling them. It could happen with the product owner, not telling them what product management or organization is saying can happen with product management, not understanding business or marketing needs. And it can happen with marketing 
not understanding what the customer really expects, right? The product is beige. It uses electricity to, to vibe on Dilbert. Yeah, right. So we can control some of those things better than others, right? We can't magically get better at understanding the customer, although there are techniques for being better and worse at it. But we can certainly discourage the creation of bugs in, in the place where most of the misunderstandings occur. Um, and that is in handoffs from one party to another, right? So maybe marketing might make the wrong choice way upstream. Let's just set that aside. What if they make the right choice? How often does the telephone game warp and distort what's supposed to be done into something completely, you know, different or irrelevant to what the original goal was, right? They start with like uh, an initiative to make it easier for for customers to onboard and you end up with a... Uh, of the user story that's like, as a developer, I want my database to have some index on some table that doesn't matter, right? It's like the telephone game kind of warps what's supposed to be done because it's not um, it's not a good handoff process. So that's one place. Well, and I would add really quick, I would add to that, that um, like the set of Caponula likes to point out that what we coined here in the cafe as, as Caponula's first law is that the, the requirements are never finished. So, yeah, like that, that can happen, not just like at the beginning, but like anywhere in the development process, anytime. Uh, any- That's right. It can happen ex post facto. So what happens is an assumption that somebody made either implicitly or explicitly is not valid now. And whether the reason that it's not valid now is that it was never valid because it was an implicit assumption that was wrong, or it simply ceased to be valid because either the technical context, the technological context of the application or service or whatever has changed or and this happens all the time, the, the, the market has simply changed, the appetite of the user has changed, right? Somehow, some way, an assumption upon which your platform or whatever, uh, platform service application, et cetera, rests, that that foundation is no longer sound. And, and the crack in it that is the invalid assumption, the newly invalid assumption, or maybe always invalid assumption, manifests as, as a bug, as a customer expectation being missed right well i mean i i, I encounter a case of that I, you know this week at work actually is there was uh you know here we're uploading images you know that like we have images that are being displayed on the website for certain things and and um like w- everybody the whole engineering and design team was assuming that this part of the code i was working on was the part of the code that was going to involve where you know the, the person designing this thing like the like there's two users you have the end user and then you have like an agent that are both using this platform and so in the you know you have these pictures that the user sees and we didn't realize there's actually this separation like oh these pictures are uploaded by the administrator and these other pictures are uploaded by the agent and we had not realized that until i was digging into why certain variable names are being used it's like these are terrible variables like where, what are these image sizes where show show me these on the website give me your terminology and in that conversation with the product owner i discovered oh we actually have two different systems at play here and nobody had realized it and had we not cleared that up now we would have probably gone two three sprints without realizing oh shoot <laughs> yeah and then things would have been built up on up top of that that would also need to be attended to and, and so on and so forth. So the earlier you catch these things, the less their costs, which is, we always knew was true, right? You find a bug, you fix it right away. It costs you less than you find a bug and you let it sit around for six months and then fix it, right? So find it in requirements while you're doing your analysis and it costs even less. Yeah, the classic example uh, that we like to use comes from a client uh, long ago. So it's, it's safe to talk about, but I'm not going to use the name. Um, it was a um, hardware and software company for, for, for cable providers, like way back when that wasn't as um, homogenized an industry as it is now. It's like little boutique uh, cable providers for, for small communities in, in the, the middle part of America, you know, 100,000, 200,000 type populations. Um, anyway, so business came along with this requirement originally that we have to get rid of images that are older than seven years. And it worked its way through the business and marketing and all these people uh, and finally got down to the team. And the team started talking about how to optimize space, how to optimize storage. Because they assumed if we're getting rid of old images, it's about making sure our database doesn't get too big. And then we said, well, wait a minute, are you sure that's what this is about? Is this about optimizing storage? 
or is it about something else? And they said, well, we're getting rid of images that are too old. What else could it be about? Well, we went and talked to the business team and it turns out it was about uh, law in that state. In that state, you couldn't keep a digital image of a signature for longer than seven years. Hmm. So the strategy they were taking was getting rid of images in the live database in order to minimize the size of the live database because they thought that was the point. But see, that, that wasn't the point, right? It was legal compliance. And so then they started thinking about what about our, our backups, right? We take this backup of this database and we put it on physical hardware and we send it to some vault in a mountain. Are we out of compliance for keeping a backup of a database that's older than seven years old? Right. So they didn't just miss something that would have cost them more to fix. I mean, it would have cost them a lot more to fix if they hadn't figured that out. But it would have put them on the wrong side of the law <laughs> if they hadn't caught that. Um, so those consequences would have been would have been huge. So how does one basically get around that then? Like, how, how do you how do you detect when you are playing telephone, as it were, and how do you even tell you need to have that conversation and who do you need to have it with? You know, cause I think that's not obvious to everyone. Yeah. So you need two things. You need a high fidelity language of transfer. You need a, a way to communicate requirements that is, um, I like to say non-controversial and people tell me I should say unambiguous. Um, I think both is what you actually need. Unambiguous and non-controversial are slightly different. And I think non-controversial is the test for the lack of ambiguity. You need a requirement that is a definition of done, and that definition of done needs to be so, and I'm going to say it, non-controversial, that you'll never have disagreement between either side of the handoff as to whether or not that requirement has been met. That's half the problem, right? So what that does is convey the one requirement, but it doesn't necessarily also convey the context and make sure that people aren't ladling these other things like this is about saving space or whatever on top of it. Then what you need is a, a rigorous analysis process. And I know we, as an industry, we've developed this allergy to rigorous analysis uh, before we do anything. And that allergy is pretty obviously descended from the, <laughs> the waterfall model that we used like 20 years ago and the pain of the waterfall model, right? But we don't analyze, we're agile. Right, exactly. <laughs> I actually had, to, when Waterfall was starting its death throes, which I think are still being kicked today, I actually had someone tell me, I said, I'm going to spend some time like fixing this design and, and, and building these tests. I said, we can't do that. We don't have time to do design or tests because we're agile. And it's just like, what? <laughs> what? It actually put me off of Agile. I was like, if that's what Agile is, count me out. You don't out. have time not to. Yeah, I don't exactly. We don't have time not to. I don't know. So like that actually put a bad taste in my mouth for two years until I finally met someone who was like, no, that guy was just a, you know, kind of a... a it's zombie scrum. Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah zombie describing scrum. a zombie scrum, you know, and yeah. there's a website about... But yeah, I mean, what, what I'm hearing is you're talking about the user story. And I like the term user story. He's like, as a user, I need to do X because Y. But then also the acceptance criteria and the definition of done all have to be in there unambiguously. Yeah, and I prefer uh, behavior-driven development. And I prefer driving behavior-driven development up into the, the product development organization as far as I, can, as I can, up into the product managers, even up into the senior leadership if possible. And then add a layer of a very rigorous analysis that, that makes sure we've tied the low-level user stories and the scenarios and behaviors associated with them to the high-level statements of need, right? So like the high-level statement of need is remain in compliance <laughs> with the laws of this state. And then a lower-level need is eliminate all images of signatures that are, you know, six years and 354 days 364 days old. And then you work your way down and you maintain a, a chain of justification back to that top level intent so that people never lose sight of why they're doing something, but they also have a absolutely clear definition in their mind of what they're doing. And that's important not only because it prevents you from building the wrong thing, 
but because I think requirements and design, and when I say design, I mean software design, not like UX design or whatever, but probably that's true of UX design. Requirements and design are inextricably linked. And so the better shaped your requirements are, the more likely someone who who's pretty flexible in how they do their work is to evolve a good design, which will further discourage bugs. What's a behavior-driven development? Oh, yeah. Behavior-driven development is, uh, well, <laughs> I mean, everything that's formative, the question, what is this? You can get a bunch of different answers from a bunch of different people. But when I talk about behavior-driven development, I'm talking about something that's kind of related to the version of behavior-driven development you might see on like cucumber.org or whatever, but not exactly that. So to me, behavior-driven development is about taking the behavior of your software and literally making it the primary driver of everything you do. Kind of the same way that test-driven development was a driver for how developers like designed and built their code. Behavior-driven development can be a way of taking what the system's going to do, and I'm going to explain what I mean by that in just a second, and using to drive how a software team consumes, implements, and verifies the implementation of a requirement. So when I say what the software is going to do, I mean something pretty specific. What I mean is how the software is going to transition from one state into another state based on a, a stimulating event. Um, and that, I think, ties in pretty well with the Gherkin syntax, which is what a lot of people think behavior-driven development is. I think, I think the Gherkin syntax is part of behavior-driven development. It ties in very well with the Gherkin syntax, which defines an initial state in a series of given clauses. You say, like, given I have an image in the database of a signature, and that image is six years, 364 days old, when I sweep my database for legal compliance, then that image still exists, right? And that's just one set of states. I have this situation, this thing happens, and now everything is, is this new way, right? So each behavior is one of those state transitions, um, and we, we chop our requirements up into an array of, of very fine-grained state transitions. Again, kind of the same way that maybe 10 years ago, a software developer might take a requirement they were given in a user story and chop it up into tests to drive the, the shape of a class or a system of classes or something like that. So Gherkin syntax can help you avoid getting into a pickle. Yes. Oh, oh that one gave me a stomach ache. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Gherkin syntax can help you avoid getting into a pickle. If you use it right. It's not like a, a magic bullet. You can't just start saying given, when, then, and have it work. I don't know how many times you've seen that happen where, like, the user stories and whatever the story tracking system, they go, we're going to start using BDD. And what that means is they take the as a, and they put it in the given, and the I want to, and they put it in the when, and the so that, and they put it in the then, in the acceptance criteria field. And then they say they're doing BDD, and it doesn't help. And then they say BDD doesn't help. So it's, it's not just the Gherkin syntax, but it's exploiting the Gherkin syntax to create a layer of extremely fine-grained, unambiguous requirements that are the definition of kind of a laminar flow from one state into another state through an event and, and through the system and then, and then back out. Well, I, I guess that gets into the old problem of any methodology is that some manager hears about it at a conference and then they implement it and it's like swapping out the bread in your sandwich for lettuce and saying it's health food. It's like conference during development. What'd you oh, say? Conference. <laughs> conference driven development. <laughs> yeah. I can't tell you how many times in the last ten years I've I've run into that, right? Someone's like, uh, I went to a conference and I heard I heard uh, software design works. You guys should do design. Like, that's what they tell the developers. You guys should start doing that. <laughs> TDD works real well, I hear. You should start doing TDD. And then, like, two weeks later, they're like, well, are you doing TDD? <laughs> are you doing it now? Is it working? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it, you know, there's Scott Adams, who, who creates Dilbert, has pointed out that he he tries really, really hard to come up with entirely fictional scenarios that are so over the top that couldn't possibly be real. And he said, I have yet to manage it. 
because yep. you know you see the pointy haired boss going. You know, I've heard good things about uh, you know about uh, what, was, what was that? What about relational databases? <laughs> um, I've done the I've done the hard part. I found out about it. Now go implement one. <laughs> so it's like yeah. we already use one. Why is your part taking so long? You know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. It's uh, it's um, it is funny that that happens. Yeah, I, the Dilbert thing you mentioned is funny because I worked at a company where uh, I don't know if you remember the one where the boss comes and says, "In order to improve quality, we're now going to pay five dollars for every bug found and another five for every bug fixed." And the <laughs> testers and the and the developers high five. <laughs> Woohoo! We're rich. <laughs> it's like I'm gonna. I'm going to write myself a new minivan this afternoon. <laughs> and and, and uh, I worked for a company where, where I pointed that one out because, because they were going to try the same thing. And then someone worked for a company that had like been through seven mergers and purchases into getting to that company. He goes, actually, the company that I worked for is the company that that was written about. And I said, are you sure? <laughs> Are you sure that's not just a pattern he noticed? And, yeah. yeah, I think a lot of people think that they're being written about by Scott Adams, and then it just turns out <laughs> it's like no nope. human stupidity nope. is universal. Yeah, it's it 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 really is, and we 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 make it worse. You know, mm-hmm. I sure hope you know you know here we have these conversations, and I walk away from these, and I've got all these ideas bouncing around in my brain, and I. I talk to other people about, oh, there's this really cool thing. And I'm like, you know, there's that little nagging voice in the back of my head going, are you sure you're not making the problem worse? Because, <laughs> yeah. Um, I just love hype cycles. <laughs> I remember when everybody was uh, doing no SQL because that was web scale. You don't do SQL databases for uh, web uh, sites because they're, they're not web scale. Oh, they were serverless too then, weren't they? Serverless was also the the fad. No database, no server, except there was both. <laughs> yeah. And it's like now it's like uh it's almost coming for a full circle where you're supposed to basically develop a a thick client that runs in the browser and deploy it over a CDN and have it talk to your or have I have I missed that boat? Is that one already done, that fad? <laughs> I think I think we're in it. Or microservices, like uh Senator Kapanulu was talking about the fact that Microservices are not automatically the answer, the panacea that they're held up as. Like more often than not, they're just going to create more headaches than anything. Mm-hmm. It's like if 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 you're just starting on a project, please don't use microservices unless you're, you know, what Google. <laughs> you probably shouldn't be going down that road. Yeah, people people treat things like they're like they're the goal, right? They treat microservices, they treat TDD, they treat BDD, they treat all these things like they're the goal instead of the goal is is a high output of good software that is what the business team wants. And ideally, the business team wants what actually is going to help the business and help the marketplace, right? Yeah. Um, but, but people go but, like, oh, you know, we need to do this thing. Like that's somehow what you want, right? Yeah, we, we don't necessarily need BDD or DDD or TDD or whatever. It's just that the managers have ADD. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Miyagi didn't really need his cars waxed, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, well, <laughs> actually, didn't that, I think that actually got riffed on, there was a series called Cobra Kai that actually brought back the original actors for the, the yeah. Daniel and Ferd, I can't remember the name. It's, yeah, yeah. He's, it's, it's awesome. awesome. But there's it's a, a it's scene a... where he, the kid's cleaning the window and he says, uh, Sensei, is there a particular way you want me to do this? He's like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's in the that's on the Cobra Kai side. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, but on the Miyagi-Do side, they still do care about every everything yes. being done that particular way. But yes, that is that was a good little uh, sock to the original set of movies. Yes. Excuse me, could I get another coffee with heavy cream? Thanks. What's this? Some sort of mask? Oh, yeah, just, what is this? That's Boyan. He was pretending to be you to trick the unicorn into revering what he's getting for his birthday. Is that why the unicorn was laughing hysterically earlier? Yes. By the way, what's the special today? Chai latte. 
Also, guests can get 35% off any order from Manning Publications at Manning.com with the coupon code PODBUGHUNT21. That's good for their live projects too. Oh yeah, live projects. Those guided projects that you complete in your local development environment with expert guidance from developers like Max Guernsey. You get to collaborate with mentors and other participants. Hmm, I wonder if they have any live projects on understanding how Boyan's mind works. I think you're on your own there, Annie. So you mentioned a minute ago, or a few minutes ago, <laughs> that there were two things you do to, to keep the bugs from ever being able to manifest. Uh, and one of them was the requirements. Uh, what, what was the other? Uh, what was the other part of that? Yeah, well, remember, it's always about, in my opinion, or at least almost always about, an assumption that is now wrong. And while requirements are one of the ways that assumptions can be wrong, either because they were always or because they become wrong, another thing that can happen is in the actual implementation side, right? So the the code and the tests and and all of that. Um, if we take a requirement and we implement it and we put it in the code, but we don't leave anything there to remind us of that requirement when we're going and making updates, then our chances of breaking that requirement later go way up. And, and that will also manifest as a bug. So the classic example of this, the one that I think the industry as a whole is, is beginning to accept, is tests. Um, I still see a lot of people write their tests second, um, but it, at least they're writing them now, right? I mean, 15 years ago, the battle was, should you write tests or not? Oh, that's a tester's job, right? Now the battle is, when should you write your tests and how should you write your tests? Which is just, that's progress. Um, but there's other things we can do. So I, I can either dig into the testing thing or we can we can talk about... Well, let me just give you another another point. That's, that's um, The other thing we can do is design. I think that uh, people do not pay enough attention to design. They often say that same thing that they always say because what they're doing is they're focusing on motion instead of progress, which is I don't have time to attend to the design here, right? I don't have time for design. I need to implement software. And one of the things I think people are forgetting when they say that is the last person I know of who actually built software was my father because he took a physical piece of media and a physical stylus and physically stab pieces of, of that media out of it <laughs> in order to create an instruction card and then physically put those pieces, uh, those instructions in a particular order. And that was a program at the beginning of his career, um, in, at least in some contexts. That is making software. That is building software. That job is automated today. I have never built software. Even when I wrote assembly code, I did not build software. I built a plan to build software. I built, dare I say it, a design for software, right? Mm -hmm. So the first thing we have to recognize is there's no such thing as modern software development work that isn't design work. You are only building a design. The only thing that matters is a design because that's the thing you're doing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So getting people out of that mode helps them address this other problem of not paying attention to design. Once they recognize that they're doing design no matter what, and their choice isn't, do I do design or not? Their choice is, do I do design well or do I do it badly? It helps steer people towards well. The reason I'm bringing all this up is that I think a good design, and this is something I learned from one of my partners way back before we were partners, right? partners at, at DevCraft, uh, way back before we were partners, he started helping me understand that a good design is one that maps very well to its requirements. I would say it's natural to its requirements, and he would say it is an expression of the requirements. And that's a pretty subtle distinction when compared to, I don't have time to do design, so I'm just going to build a giant nested set of if-elses and switches and for loops. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, I, I like the term software engineering, and there's people who debate it. it's like, well, software, and you know, you're not this. We're, no, we're not building bridges, but I think it's, I think sometimes the term is helpful to remind us of 
kind of some of the disciplines that we need that successful software development involves because you will never find a qualified successful engineer who will say i have to build this bridge i don't have time to design it i just need to build it and they start bolting together pieces of metal like no right. one's gonna do that they're they're, they're starting their work you can go well, what are you doing the bridge has to be built over there you know you're 20 miles away from the build site what's wrong with you i'm designing it yeah oh it, okay there's a bunch of industries that have kind of awakened to that part of the structure of the universe, right? That, that you, you have to do things in a certain order and you have to really understand what you're doing before you do it. And, st- and so as, as groups of professionals, engineers, lawyers have, have done this to a certain extent, um, they've said, it doesn't matter what you tell me, I'm going to do things this way because we've got a thousand years of evidence that this is the way to do things, you know? You could just shout all you want and, and you could fire me, but you're not going to get me to do it wrong. I think what we need is for that to seep into just our daily lives. And if, if that happened, then we wouldn't have each and every industry having to stand up for doing things the right way. Like if you imagine changing a tire, right? The fundamental problem here is people focusing on motion, on creating the appearance of doing something over progress, on creating actual verifiable incremental progress. So if you imagine changing a tire, and trying to create as much motion as you can. You're swinging that, you know, T-shaped wrench thing around and slamming it into the hubcap, and then maybe you stick your fingers in and yank the hubcap out and throw it out into the street, jam the... It, wouldn't, it would take you forever to change a tire that way. Even if you were an experienced tire-changing guy, it would take you, you know, hours and hours of extra time slamming the, that, that nut thing into the... <laughs> the wrench thing into the nut thing reefing on it. I guess the reefing on it might actually work, but everything else would just <laughs> add time, right? Once you finally got it seated, you could, you could get it. It would take you forever. And this is, this is the approach that people take towards, especially towards fixing bugs, but actually towards software development, software engineering in general, is the important thing is to demonstrate that I'm making an effort, right? It's like they've forgotten the distinction between effort and work. <laughs> And if you challenge them on it and say, well, you're, you're, you're wasting all this time pounding on the hubcap, then what do they always go to? It's like, well, I make progress and I do the reefing. I was, I was having a discussion with a guy recently about he wanted to follow a particular methodology and it was very ill-suited to the situation we were in, but he wanted to, he wanted to follow it. And I'm, I'm looking at this and going, why are you wanting this? You know, you could do this, you do this, you do this. Like, well, I want to do it this way because of these strengths. I'm like, yeah, but these others have those strengths too, but you have this weakness and he actually, turns around and he reframes the weakness as somehow some sort of strength yeah it's like oh well yeah it's 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 really bad at that and that's a good thing because it like you're what is like justifying motion yeah <laughs> what did i get done in the last half hour well i expended 700 calories trying to turn the lug nut clockwise <laughs> <laughs> and then and then and then we start talking about the calorie counts and can you estimate your calorie that's counts for the next well i need to know how many calories you're burning every hour on this because that's the goal here wait <laughs> That's the goal. I think and then we have the burn down charts of the calories, and then we start ranking companies based on those burn down charts. <laughs> it's barely moved. It's barely moved. I don't know how many calories it's going to take to get this lug nut off. <laughs> I think I think we need a spike on this. <laughs> <laughs> there goes your other tire. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, and now I understand where you got your comics from. I mean, you have all those comics on your blog about <laughs> software development applied to the real world. I kept so this whole conversation. I kept imagining those people digging down to the bedrock. You know, digging down. <laughs> Get up the hill, you dig down. It's like, <laughs> it's like, well, it's motion. We're making motion. Dig faster. Dig faster. Yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> more. Oh, let's try explosives now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. People. I mean. Yeah. A noise so, is really signifying nothing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's Monarch. No, I know that's not really the Monarch who said that. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, maybe you don't watch... Uh... <laughs> Never mind. Yeah, I, I, I might not. But I, I was thinking, like, and it, it becomes where Agile becomes contortionism. It's like, mm-hmm. We're Agile. Intellectual. Like, that's great, but I just put my back out trying to understand your requirements. Yeah, exactly. I was working for a client that had completely adopted Agile. They had two dailies, and on each daily there was 29 persons, and it was 
quite wonderful. And then there were ceremonies, backlog examination and all that stuff. And then I honestly don't know how many hours in a week I actually did something useful. It was meetings and meetings and meetings. Right. And these companies, they do that, right? They go, oh, well, you know, we should only be expecting this much time out of a developer because they need to spend the rest of the time to just servicing the ceremonies, right? Six hours. And then the, the, the two hours a day they get burned on ceremonies, lower, lower productivity. As so they go, productivity has really dropped. We better have some meetings to figure out what that is. Now they got five hours a day, right? And they go, well, we better, now we got an extra hour a day. We better lower everybody's expected development time to five hours a day. Why does productivity keep dropping? <laughs> you know, just... exactly. No, it, well, and anybody who does that is not doing Scrum. I want to, I want to hasten to point that out because you know we, we associate that with Scrum and Agile because almost every implementation of Scrum and Agile is exactly that. But well, exactly what you're describing. But if you actually read the Scrum, Agile, I mean, I, I had to implement it on a team, and so I did something amazing. I went and actually read the Scrum Guide, which I don't think most people have ever bothered to do. And it's not that long. It took me an hour. And it talks about, like, get out of the way. It's like minimize the thing. Okay, you have a stand-up. This should be time box to 10 minutes. If you can't, you know, th th time box. There's a term. There's a novel idea. Time box. It means that when that time runs out, anybody in that room has the authority to go, okay, meeting's over. See ya. It's like, and the, the, the sprint planning, time box. Two hours maximum. As I, they, they reckon they're like, like two, if, if it's a two-week sprint, two hour, two hour, which is a good good time. And that's for the whole two weeks. Sprint review, two hours. Retro, one hour. Yeah. And these are time boxes. It's like, okay, well, meeting's over. See you. And you leave. And that that little detail has been lost because there's so many companies that just like, well, we're doing Agile. And what they're really doing is the same thing they were already doing. They're just putting new labels on it, like you mentioned with the, the, the BDD earlier. But they were writing a user story and they just slap different labels on the parts of it and say it's, you know, the same but, as they were doing before. Exactly. Yeah. But it's just putting lipstick on the pig. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's another problem, right? Is people will take something like that. They won't even really take the time to understand the thing they're, they're trying to implement. They won't understand Scrum. They won't understand uh, less. They won't understand safe. They won't understand whatever it is. They'll come up with this picture of the process, right? They'll create like a, you know, like in the ghost town, not the ghost towns, the, the ghost towns in the movies where, <laughs> where it's just a facade, right? Mm. They'll just come up with the fronts of the houses to make it look like they've done whatever the, the process says they should do. But then if you walk around to the back, you see it's just, just still holding all of that up. <laughs> it's just <laughs> it's just the appearance of, of following these. Is that because they lost sight of the requirements? Could that be it? They lost sight of the requirements. Yeah. And the goals, exactly what you're talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the same thing, right? They're they're thinking that the purpose is to do that. This is a recipe for success, rather than a set of toolkits that have led to success, right? It's like if I wanted my house to be in better order, I couldn't just go strap on a tool belt and then just grab random things and swing them at the walls. Right? I would need someone who knew how to use those tools to actually apply them correctly. And that is not me. But uh, yeah, but I at least know it. But they think, oh, here's this recipe. I'll follow this recipe, you know, and I'll let it bake in the oven for, for three PIs and ding, out comes success. And that's just not how it works, right? Is they, they have to actually attend to the reasons why they're doing it. And I mean, even Scrum, if I'm not mistaken, says inspect and adapt, right? You try this stuff, but your goal is to continuously improve throughput. And whatever you're doing isn't improving throughput. You put some time into figuring out why, and and then, and then you address that, right? And that's a, that's actually a great. If since we're talking about Scrum, that is a great example of an anti-pattern I see on the process side, which I don't normally talk about, is the like dangling retrospective, right? Where they they go and they do the retrospective and they talk about all the problems they had, and maybe even go as far as to do the root cause analysis. And then they're just like, well, good meeting everybody. <laughs> and then walk away. They don't actually come up with like an action plan or a budget or anything to actually address the problems. They're just like, yep, the universe sucks. Time to go <laughs> drink out. <laughs> and then it be like code. one company I know of where they would do those retros. And the result was every single person at the company could detail the exact same <laughs> list of the hundred things that were wrong with the company and the reason why 
they could not ship good code consistently. Nobody fixed one, right? Exactly, because management was like, well, we're having the retro. <laughs> yeah. So it's, Retro's why is it not getting better? Go away. You know, here, have some money. You know? <laughs> it's like... It's like, do you not see the attrition rate here? It's, it's uh, well, yes, we need to hire faster. It's like, oh, good lord, yeah. <sighs> oh, yeah. But I think you know, getting back to the the technological side of things and motion over progress or progress over motion, which is what I prefer. I think that we can get a lot of mileage in both bug prevention and actually bug elimination when when we do get one out of things like more heavily investing in design. So if you think about refactoring, if you think about very detailed, incremental, transformative refactoring, not the loosey-goosey, I'm refactoring this to do something completely different, which isn't refactoring at all, or I'm really, I'm rewriting this, but it's going to have kind of the same basic intent and a new design, so I'm going to call that refactoring. Not None of that. But the actual, like, transformative, I'm going to make a slight change and a slight change and a slight change and a slight change until all of a sudden everything comes together and, oh, now there's a strategy pattern manifest in my code. And now this is open-closed to this kind of, of variation, whereas before it was a, a switch statement off the type code or something like that, right? You think about those as not just ways to improve code, but as techniques you can use to address bugs and address them in a way that would discourage them from existing in the future, it's kind of interesting, right? So so my strategy when I do find a bug is not to hunt it like a classic kind of hunter who like picks up a scent or picks up a trail and like tracks down the bug along that trail. I try to make the bug come to me. So I try to build tests. I try to build logging. I try to, most importantly, start to understand the design. And if I can't understand the design, start to change the design into something that I can understand. Because often you'll get to the point where you're trying to make a design change and suddenly you're like, oh, I cannot make this design change because this part doesn't work right. And I don't, and there's no good design that would support this defect. And the finding the bug, I'm sure you've talked many times about the fact that finding the bug is the hard part right? Fixing the bug is usually the easy part. Finding is the hard part, right? So you can find it by taking the area where you kind of know it is, trying to pin it down in tests, trying to get more kind of surveillance in the form of logging, and most importantly, starting to get the design to where it's more natural to your understanding of the requirements until you reach a point where you truly understand what's working and what's not. So you're not a bug hunter, you're a bug trapper. Perhaps, mm-hmm. yeah. I'm a bug... Uh, Corraler. <laughs> yes. I yeah. see you on the back of a bug with a lasso. <laughs> so, right. A bug a bug trapper is is good. I, I cut off you spend your time figuring out not figuring out where the bug is, but figuring out where it isn't. Right? I'm gonna take this stuff and refactor it and, and try to kind of extract it out into its own class. And then when it's, it's in its own class, I can start to build better tests around it. And if I can build better tests around it, those tests can tell me definitively, does this behavior that I don't want manifest here or not? And I might even go so far, I usually go so far, as to write a test for the current behavior. So a test that would fail if the bug were fixed. Yeah, right. I remember Scott Ford talking about that before with us. Is you know, not, don't just test for success; test for the expected failure too. And yeah, make sure that you. Well, and it sounds to me like you know, going back to design, it sounds to me, and perhaps this is what your you know your your live projects for Manning, your unit testing uh, with Java J Unit Five and IntelliJ Ideas is, is about is this idea of of designing tests because I think a lot of people don't go into tests with the design aspect; they go in with the same. I think I'm even guilty of this. They go, we, we, we go in with this idea of, I just need to implement the test. It's like, I implement the code, I implement the tests, and, and bang, boom, done. Or if you're TDD, then you I implement the test, implement the code. And I see in most cases, like I was turned up to TDD early on because I just see people write a bunch of tests without any intentionality to design. I'm like, well, I'll write it right after because that way I've designed the code and then I can design tests that are going to, be based on what I now think I expect the code to do and that's going to make it more likely that when I don't match my expectations, the tests are going to fail. I'm not going to be coding to a test. And I think that's a mistake some people make. So how do you design a test, basically? It's a really good question because it ties the two things that I've been talking about together. The 
best kind of design for a test is one that reflects a requirement. Requirements, individual requirements, individual behavior scenarios, like specific BDD scenarios, they actually change very slowly. Far more slowly than your your code design tends or to your framework your production or your framework or the overall requirements, right? We want overall requirements to change you know, every couple hours, right? We want you to take one little behavior and implement it and get it as far through the pipeline as you can before you start on the next one. And we want that cycle to be fast, right? That's what we want. So the, the synthesized behavior of your product should be changing on a moment to moment basis. However, the individual behaviors that you're connecting together very rarely change. Someone doesn't go, uh, you know what? I don't need both the username and the password to log in, right? <laughs> they don't change their minds on that. Sometimes they'll add something, right? They might add a new way to log in, right? And sometimes they'll take things away, but they don't often change them. And most importantly, when they change them, it's because there's an actual change to that requirement. So if you start to design your tests around a requirement each, and when I say a requirement, I mean a behavior in your, your, your body of requirements, you'll find that you have a lot less of this, I changed one thing in my product code and now 20 tests have failed because they were all touching that thing issue that, that a lot of people end up with in their, their test suites, right? Like, which is linked to the reason why people want to test after. They want to test after to avoid churn. But you can also avoid churn by linking each test to, to a requirement. Yeah, I mean, I test after because I don't want to fall into the trap of coding because I, my own brain, like everyone's brain is different. I find if I write the test first, then I wind up coding to the test and I wind up tiptoeing around defects in the test that I didn't even, wasn't fully aware of. Like I wind up coding into a defect. But when I, when I go the other way around and I still try to do it very quickly after, but when mm -hmm. I go the other way around, then it forces me to test to the requirement because I don't remember how I implemented the code. Hmm. So I'm leveraging my memory to make it a glitch in my memory to make that disconnect. Because I think the I think the ultimate goal, it sounds like the ultimate goal, correct me if I'm wrong, but like my philosophy has always been don't code to your test and don't test to your code. Hmm. Go to your requirement, test to your requirement. Hmm. Because if you code to your test, then you're going to tiptoe around possible misunderstandings and possible bugs and possible issues. If you test to your code, then you're going to test around defects in your design. But if you code and test to the requirement, then you're going to uncover those flaws because you're not inherently like you're doing terrible things. Your code as Jeff Abel would say, I think I have a different philosophy and it's built around that concept that I introduced kind of closer to when I sat down the chain of justification. Remember me using that phrase, the, the chain of like in the requirements, the chain of justification from I want to be compliant with legal to I want to get rid of signatures Sure. You know, before seven years. And I, I want that chain to travel all the way down to the expression of a piece of a requirement in the product code. Hmm. So I want a link from, you know, a particular fragment of the condition in an if statement. I want a series of steps that gets me from there to what an executive said and why, if I can have it. And to do that, at a lower level, everything at a more detailed level has to be descended from the step above it, right? So I have to know that my mid-level requirements are justified by the top requirements because they are descended from them. And repeat that process down to where I'm a developer and I do TDD. And so then the first thing I do is I say, okay, well, I need to inherit, I need to descend this test from my requirement. So I take the requirement, and usually it's already it's already defined as, as given when then, as is Gherkin, right? And I'll build out a test that is a bunch of method calls that express that same behavior. If I'm doing like, you know, J unit or N unit or whatever, I'll build out a test that expresses those, but those are all empty, right? They're just empty methods. Well, actually they don't exist. And then I use the IDE to create them, right? Then I go in and I use those to drive a design. And now I know that the design I know that the, the bindings of the test are inherited from the specification manifest in the, the top level method of the test, which is inherited from the behavior that justified that, 
right? So now I know the design is descended from the, the bindings. And then you can see where this goes, right? Then I go in and they take the design and I say, now I'm going to I'm going to imbue behavior into my product code. I already know where it should be because that was linked ultimately to my ultimate requirement by this chain of justification. I imbue the behavior there and make the test pass. So I, I'm trying to have each thing drive the, the piece that I think should be descended from it and then have each link in that chain be able to tell me whether or not the link beneath it is, is there. Right. Which of course, then then this also brings in other <laughs> other things that that are helpful. And like I do a lot of work on legacy code, things that are missing tests, but also missing um, good names. Good naming mm-hmm. conventions are helpful for reflecting requirements. Um, comments, I like intent comments. I tell people like comment why it's there, but like put the explain the bit. You know, put that little fragment. What what fragment of business logic? What fragment of requirement are you actually fulfilling here? Like relate back to that. Commit messages, justify. You know, okay, this change is related to this requirement. So you look through the commit log, you can see, okay, so this is satisfying this part of the requirement. And so you have all of these, what would be considered non-code artifacts, communication artifacts. And it sounds like from what you're saying that these need to also tie back. These these are tools that we can actually use then, I would think, to tie back to those requirements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, although I I have a definite ordering of preference uh, right I'd, I would rather use a, a class name or a method name than a comment if I could right or a test or something like that but yeah yeah these are all tools that we can apply and we must apply especially when there's not another tool we prefer to do the same thing yeah Again, never send, never send a comment to do a name's job but don't ever send a name exactly to comment, but also never send a comment a name to do a comments job yeah if you're gonna get a, a 90 character name, Shorten the name and come up with a good a good dot com, <laughs> on the or end. look or, or actually first inspect the names above it because namespace yeah. should be telling a lot too, and also the tests right because tests should be telling you the tests are the why for the what of the code mm-hmm. right so so if you're having to explain why something works a certain way then that means that reading the tests doesn't tell someone that already. And that can mean either that, that it's not written down in the test or that they can't easily find the test that says that or something like that. But yeah, never send a thing to do another thing's job <laughs> if you can avoid it. Absolutely. Yeah. So we always like asking, and I think this would probably take a different form with you. What's the weirdest bug? And normally I would say, you yeah, know, what's the weirdest bug you ever found? But maybe what's the weirdest bug you ever, I don't know, trapped or anticipated? Or at least one that that that's mm-hmm. like, that was a I'm so glad I caught that. That would have been terrible. <laughs> I suppose it's probably a fairly recent bug. There's a bank. And the bank allows you to schedule transactions. And they're rewriting their online banking stuff. And at some point, they want to turn off one and turn on the other. Right? Right? And through that rigorous analysis that I was talking about, I helped them discover that their current plan was kind of like promising themselves a huge production support incident in that if uh, you shut off one system and you turn on another, what happens to all those scheduled payments in the first system? Ooh. Huge, huge problem with a very, very simple solution of only shut off the front end of the first one until the the run out period for the schedules right so you can imagine like well i actually can't imagine what the savings was because i don't i don't really have a good grip on what it would have cost them to go and manually remediate god knows how many <laughs> yeah it's hard to comprehend numbers that large anyway and 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 when when the solution is just don't turn off the back end until it's <laughs> processed those other <laughs> those other payments. Yeah, that's that's an example. Wow. Um, and and a great example of how an ounce of prevention is worth, I guess, a gigaton of <laughs> cure <laughs> in this case. <laughs> well, I, mean, I, I have to say, I mean, it even relates back to I was talking to someone recently. He was like, well, why are you wasting all this time on paying down technical debt? I'm like, well, because... You know, I'm working with an existing company. So it's like, well, because 
the sooner I can figure out what's needed out of the system, I can basically get the, the requirements and the code back in line with each other, then the faster it'll be for future developers to add new functionality. It's like we, we see so many of these things like paying down technical debt, writing tests, designing, whatever, and you, that, back to that phrase you're talking about at the beginning of, uh, I don't have the time for that. It's like, that's very short-term thinking. Yes, it's going to cost some money now, or it's going to cost literal money usually and, and time and effort you may take a scrum or two and not produce as much visible value but as a result you can do more in subsequent sprints you can do more in subsequent development cycles but on the you know if you don't if you just leave it you defer it that technical debt the design debt i would say too accrues a, that further debt it's just it's like a credit card it just keeps building on interest and then when you try to pay it down later because all technical debt is a blocker waiting for a place to happen. Sooner or later, you're going to have to pay it down. But when you three years from now, it's going to be, while well, you've got to get it out of the way to fix this critical bug right now, and you only have two days, and it's going to take you four days to pay down. Right. Check that. And sometimes people don't realize it actually can be faster. Like, they think, well, I, I don't have time to do this. Again, I don't have time to fix this. And we say, well, but ultimately, it's more sustainable because you'll get rid of those blockers. But sometimes it's just faster to get your immediate goal done in a way that improves quality, that, that gets rid of some technical, some technical debt. So I have an example of that where someone had an ID. They were using a whole bunch of queries in their backend service, just a ton of them, I think 70. And they needed to switch to another ID. And I said, well, this ID, you're passing this number around, right? And now you need to pass this list of numbers for something else around. In reality, the number isn't what really matters, and this new list of numbers isn't what really matters. What really matters is that you have this concept of a customer, and you happen to be using the ID to identify a customer, right? And you wish you were using this other list of IDs to identify the customer. The real problem isn't that you were using the wrong thing to identify a customer, and now you need to use the right thing to identify a customer. The real problem is that you're passing around IDs instead of just like a customer object. So we don't have time to fix it. We don't have time to fix it. And I said, humor me. Let's just humor me for a minute. Let's say, let's build a customer object. Let's have the customer object be responsible for adding the constraints to the where clause, right? Instead of plucking it around in 70 different places. And let's put the effort into to building this and, and making the work be, fix this design problem forever. And they said, okay, we'll humor you for a few hours. So we started working on it and we built it together and didn't add the thing they really thought they cared about, which was the switching the IDs. We just worked on, on threading this customer object around where they were passing in a primitive instead. And two days later, they came back and they said, I can't, I can't believe this. I said, what? And they said, well, we had three sprints scheduled for, for solving this, but it looks like now it's only going to take us a few days, mm -hmm. right? So a little refactoring doesn't always make things better later. I mean, it does always make things better later, but it doesn't always only make things better later. Sometimes it makes things better right now, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. All that time that would go into like, well, can you just fix this bug? It's like, okay, yes, I can hack around this terrible design decision here, but that's going to take me five days. I would rather take those same five days to just fix the problem. Yeah. And maybe it won't even take you all five, you know. And if it does, okay. But now the problem's solved, but, you know. And going back to motion over progress, right? If you are making incremental design changes, you can show, I am making progress towards this solution to, to a sufficiently educated <laughs> audience. You can, mm -hmm. right? You can say, I am solving this problem of we're using the wrong thing. There's 71 places where you're using the wrong thing yesterday. Now there's 43, you know, and then, oh, there's 43 yesterday. Now there's two. Okay, they're all using the right thing. Now all I have to do is take that one thing and switch it over, right? If you can get people to accept progress as the thing they're tracking instead of just, are you frantically flailing your arms around and sometimes tapping a key on your keyboard, um, you know, then, then it's, it's a fairly easy sell at that point. This has been an awesome conversation. I feel like I've learned a lot. Enjoyed it. Same here. <laughs> we always get the best guests. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.
Bog Hunters Cafe, this is Jess. We are open 24-7 at boghunters.cafe. You can also find us on Twitter as Bug Hunters Cafe. Oh yes, music is provided by audionautics.com. We have a link on our website. Yes, you heard right. You can win free access to Max Guernsey's live project, Unit Testing Wade Java, JUnit 5, and IntelliJ IDEA. For your chance to win, just retweet our Twitter post about it, and then follow Bug Hunters Cafe for the announcement of the winner in a few weeks. No, I haven't heard whether the unicorn will be giving anyone something like that for a birthday gift. You sound familiar. Bohan, I know it's you. Aww. It was worth a try. <laughs>